On a gray night in February, a high school freshman leaves her boyfriend's house and makes her way to the bus stop. Halfway down a lonely block, she notices a man walking behind her. The young girl crosses over to the other side of the street. The man follows. In a moment, the young girl is grabbed from behind, dragged off the sidewalk and into the backyard of an abandoned garage. After he was done, he stood me up and he threw me to the ground. Now I just laid there and I watched him jump over the fence. And then I stood up and pulled my underwear and my pants up. Janet Cha walks back to her boyfriend's house and calls police. I couldn't see his face because he would never he wouldn't let me look at his face, but I know he was bald, you know, shaved head. And he was um, about medium build. And he was like about six feet. A nurse documents Cha's injuries and collects a semen sample. In 1997, in Portland, sexual assaults are prioritized. Those with a named suspect get a second look. Those without get put on the shelf. Jenna Cha's case is largely forgotten. The memories, however, remain. Two miles away, in another working class neighborhood, 15-year-old Michelle Horst says goodbye to a friend and begins the short walk home. Five blocks later, a man rounds the corner and crosses her path. I like kind of glanced over at him and, you know, just like a friendly smirk, you know, didn't want to be too friendly, but, or didn't want to be rude and stuck up. So I just, you know, just kind of gave him a little, and that's when he came time me and grabbed me. Michelle Horst is five foot two her attacker in excess of six feet. He drags Michelle from the sidewalk and into a yard, sheltered from street traffic. I couldn't breathe at all. I just felt like I was gonna like literally pass out. The attacker forces Michelle to the ground and rapes her in the yard. Then he tells her to count to 100 and runs into the night. He told me that he wouldn't hurt me if I just cooperated, did what he said and promised not to yell, so. And I did that. <laughs> Scared. Scared, Horst stumbles to her friend's house and calls police. At the hospital, a rape kit is taken and semen collected. Detective Paul Larson meets the victim at the hospital. During my interview of her, she said that she didn't think that she could identify the individual. Uh, he was a black male. It was dark. Like Janet Shaw before her, Michelle Horst's case has no identified suspect and is quickly tabled. No one yet recognizes the developing pattern of attack, the signature of a serial rapist. A sexual assault detail, if they have similar cases, then you know they pursue it. But apparently there was nothing that was giving them indication that there was another incident. Michelle Horst's case joins Janet Shaw's in the cold files. Two girls who attend the same high school, never knowing they share the same pain. Eight fifteen a.m. and the first bell rings for class at Jefferson High School. Fourteen-year-old Akila Johnson is running late and picks up her pace. Less than a half mile from school, she happens across a man idling on a corner. He turned to ask me a question. And I answered his question, so at that time, I was just being a bypasser, a friendly bypasser. Seconds later, Johnson is a victim, dragged between two houses and choked unconscious. I woke up crying, very eyed, foggy eyed. I, I swear I seen clouds and everything. I'm serious when I woke up. But then after everything cleared out from that, then he was there. The rape ends as suddenly as it began. Johnson's attacker gone. She runs to school, and the police are called. From her description, it sounded as if she had seen him pretty well, although he had told her at the, uh, near the end of the assault to put her, or cover her face, and what she did was put her coat over her face as he was leaving, not to watch him. Uh, but she still had been able to see him. 
Sturdivant asks Akila if she will meet with a police sketch artist. Two days later, her memory is put on paper. When I did the sketch, and they start showing me eyes and a piece of a nose and lips and you know what I'm saying, stuff that I really was just trying to vaguely remember what I saw because I really didn't look at him in his face like that, you know. Akila's drawing is distributed to law enforcement as well as the media. More than 30 suspects are generated, all of whom are questioned and eliminated. Meanwhile, semen collected from the assault yields a DNA profile of the rapist. A run through the state data bank, however, fails to provide a match. Akila Johnson joins Michelle Horst and Janet Shaw in the cold files. The connection between them hidden to everyone except the rapist himself until his appetite for little girls steals more than their innocence. Day breaks with a gray haze over Portland's north side. 14-year-old Melissa Bittler leaves early for school, eager for a morning meeting with her math teacher. At 7.30, she says her goodbyes, grabs her backpack, and crosses the street for the last time. 911, please start medical. Uh, please. What is the emergency? Um, there's a body in our backyard. There's a what? A body. Fewer than 50 steps from her own home, Melissa Bittler lies face down, her pants and underwear wrapped around her ankles. Homicide detectives Cheryl Kanzler and Paul Weatheroy survey the scene. The sexual assault was the absolute first thing that went through my mind, seeing the body the way it was, the positioning with the buttocks elevated, the pants down around her ankles. Drag marks indicate Melissa was taken from the sidewalk into the backyard. A condom wrapper lies just beyond the body. It's like you've done your terrible, nasty little deed, and now you're going to stand up, zip up your pants, and walk away, and just leave her there like a piece of garbage. At autopsy, the coroner establishes the victim was strangled. Biological samples are collected and sent to the Oregon State Police Crime Lab for DNA testing. Forensic scientist Terry Coons receives an evidence kit with five swabs. They yield a total of eight sperm heads. Using short tandem repeat DNA testing, Coons is able to do exactly that, then enters her results into the national DNA database. I compared that and saw a match to another case and pulled that case. I now know that we have a serial child rapist who was killed. DNA links the murder of Melissa Bittler to the unsolved rape of Akila Johnson four years earlier. Untested rape kits are transferred to the crime lab where DNA links two more victims, Jenna Cha and Michelle Horst. We became more hopeful we would be able to solve this but again, more worried. He's out, he's murdered Melissa. When's he gonna strike again? It's a little after 3.30 in the morning when a call is logged into 911 dispatch. A woman reports awakening to a rapist in the living room of her own home. We don't know for sure who it was. No, I can't, I can't see him. But he was choking me so hard, I passed out. I'm like, and you think it's your, who? It's your cousin, too? I'm already getting... No, it's the guy. It's his way here. Okay, I've already got the call going, okay? The ambulance is coming. The police are coming. Police arrive and remove the woman to a local hospital. The woman glimpsed her attacker's face and realized it belonged to her cousin's boyfriend, Ladon Stevens. Detectives Craig Yost and Dennis Minnis pick up the suspect and run a background check on Stevens. They find crimes against women that date back 20 years, including rape and attempted rape on girls as young as nine years old. We arrested him, took some photographs of him, because during the sexual assault, she had bit him on one of his hands and caused some scratches under one of his armpits. Marks on Stevens' body match the victim's description. Stevens claims the injuries are work-related, but Yost and Minnis aren't buying it. They believe Stevens is good for the assault and maybe more. As we're looking at him, some things are coming to, to mind. Ladon's date of birth is December 13th, which is the day that Melissa Bittler was killed. Detective Minnis said to me, you know, this guy could have done Bittler. And I said, yeah, it's very possible. Yost shares the hunch with detectives working the Bittler homicide. The initial response is mixed. Well, there was a lot of 
differences, but I think some of the similarities was that uh, he was very violent, um, that he was engaging in sex from behind, um, and he was doing it with force. I think all of those kind of made us think that maybe this might match our suspect who was escalating over time. Yost decides to roll the dice and submits Stevens' DNA standard for genetic testing. DNA links LaDon Stevens to the murder of Melissa Bittler and to the 1997 rapes of Janet Cha, Michelle Horst, and Akila Johnson. The jury sentences Stevens to life in prison without the possibility of parole. <laughs>